Thank you, and good morning, everybody. I got up this morning, and I, uh, yes, I, I do have a computer in my bedroom, and I was trying to get dressed, and I had the picture of myself uh, as promoted on the website. And I reached for my first shirt, my favorite shirt, and I realized it was the same one that my picture was taken. And so more of the story, I should go beyond the first shelf in my closet. Maybe I should downsize my closet because of the hundreds of shirts, I'm sorry to say I have. I do have hundreds of shirts. I always pick four or five to wear. So maybe, maybe I could simulate the rest of my closet out of existence. Um, thank you very much for having me here. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking a little bit about what we're doing at Spraying Systems and how we, we let down simulations and what it means to us. Um, let me start off by uh, putting a small agenda here. Uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about our company. Uh, anybody has ever heard of Spraying Systems? Not the people who work there, please. Uh, okay. I want to talk a little bit about spraying systems, and I want to talk a little bit about what sprays are and why this is significant for us. And then I want to talk about what we do in terms of performance optimization, which led to the in installation of uh, our modeling software. Uh, give you an examples of some of the things we do. Talk about our workflow, kind of the infrastructure that we have. I wish we had 20,000 cores, and the person who has 20,000 cores, we would love to talk to you. And then maybe can have some concluding remarks. So spraying systems, interestingly enough, is just 10 miles down the, down the road. We are a private company. We were founded many years ago, almost 77 years ago. And we are headquartered in Wheaton, which is not far from here. We basically make spray products and spray-related accessories for many different industrial applications. Uh, I've been with spraying systems 27 years. I had an interview, like all of us do when we have a job, and I was, uh, well, I, I've been there 27 years old, so I started working at Spring Systems at age 10. So, but uh, I was there and I asked the guy interviewing me, what, what are spray analysis used for? Why would anybody care? And actually they were hiring me to do, to do drop size analysis, and I go, who cares? I mean, I was that arrogant. The worst part is, Two things happened, he answered the question, and the second thing is I actually got that job, which was very surprising to me. But we, spray nozzles are used just about everywhere, and you'll never know about it. I mean, when my friends ask me, what are your nozzles used for, I say, well, you'll, you'll probably see them in a car wash, but that's the least interesting thing we do and the least involved thing we do. They're used to make steel, make paper, make medicine, make food, uh, automotive, uh, air travel, anything you can think of, a spray nozzle is used. We sell our nozzles to our own uh, distributor and rep offices around the world. We have almost 100 such outlets. And we're known for value added and engineering help and support and all that. And we serve, you know, more over 50 major industrial markets. This is where we work, just down the street. And we are... Uh, where our customer needs us. So in addition to these sales outlets, we manufacture at many facilities around the world where our industrial customer base is. And you mentioned I travel quite a bit. Most of the time I travel in support of engineering work at some of these facilities and in support of customer development work elsewhere. So where do you use them and why, uh, why are we interested in simulations? If you're buying a spray nozzle to wash a car, obviously this is not a simulation type job. Most of the, the work we use where we find use for simulations and what we call some of the advanced type of applications like oil and energy, food, pharmaceutical, uh, process industries, lately a lot of phosphate, sulfuric acid, cement, that type of stuff. Uh, we're in mining, we're also in, in steel, and these are the type of applications that de demand a little bit more engineering work than, say, selling a, a nozzle to a car wash. So these are just some of the typical applications where we, we see a lot of this heavy engineering work involved, and these are what we call the uh, engineering type applications. When, when you talk about a spray nozzle or, or liquid or a fluid mechanics or, or atomization in general, we are in business, spraying systems is in business because we're able to take a liquid, liquid mass and atomize it. We're able to take that liquid mass and spread it some into space on a target in a particular way. 
that is the, the thing that we do, and that's the complex part of what we do. It's really taking a liquid jet, atomizing it, and, and making a spray out of it. And of course, many things that uh, come out of this, primarily what a customer may be interested in is how the liquid is deposited and what the droplet size is. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in detail. And this droplet size and the shape of the spray is very complex, and it depends a lot on what pressure you're operating on and what capacity of the nozzle on and spray angle and all that type of stuff. But this particular mechanism itself manifests its way into different types of shapes of product that control the shape, that control the angle, control the, the capacity, and so on. So this is essentially what we make. This is a very small section of it. Some are more advanced, some are less advanced. But these are the types of sprays we make, and these, this is where the business of uh, spraying systems is. Of significance in many of these, what we call process type applications, uh, is the droplet size. Because in the particular uh, application, if you're trying to react with a chemical, or you're trying to neutralize a gas, or condition, a, a, a reduce a temperature, or anything like that, drop size plays a big, big role. And that's where a lot of our focus in the high-end applications tends to be, is on spray characterization and primary drop size collection. Bear with me, I'm almost done. I'll get to the good stuff. So we have labs, and the labs are used to develop products that are used to, that we sell. But also the labs are used to do a lot of research to gather more insight on the products for customer service type things and, of course, development. So when we talk about obtaining a spray characteristic, we want to know what that is so we can predict how a spray will work in an environment. Some of the most important things we look at, again, like spray pattern, droplet size, and so on. And these become really important attributes. This is, for example, a way how we collect drop size. We do a laser phase uh, atomometry. We do la laser diffraction type measurements. We collect drop size. We also collect spray pattern using laser imaging techniques. Here we can find out what a spray would look like in a particular area. Now, I'm building to a case now. Now, imagine if you take that spray and put it in a, in a vessel or a reactor. You want to know what its shape is. You want to know what its drop size is. Because then you can tell the customer, yes, this is going to evaporate or this is going to quench your gas. So these are the types of things we can do in the lab to, uh, to help customers. Eventually, we create what I like to call the nozzle DNA. We can look at its shape, its velocity profile, its breakup, and all that. But this is experimental. This is what we can do in the lab. Now, sometimes that's not enough. I always like to say, well, we're not going to get a license to build a power plant behind our factory. We're not going to get a license to build a nuclear reactor. So how do we predict how a spray would operate in such, require, in such areas? And that's where we started to look at simulations. And State-of-the-art laboratories, first options, customers always want that. We, we, we do these things. Then the question becomes more complex. I'm in a reactor. It's 560 degrees. You're spraying up. We're spraying down. We have structural elements. We have uh, baffles. We have heat exchangers. How do we navigate around all that? And about 15, about 10 years ago, 10, 11 years ago, we started to say, well, we want to provide that service. And the impetus came from two things. One, the need for higher precision, and two, the need to create yet another competitive edge. Uh, in science and engineering, everybody evolves. Everybody evolves. So you cannot reach a point and say, I'm very comfortable, I have a value-added service, and nobody's going to touch it. Yes, you will lose that competitive edge to hungry competitors that are coming. So I like to do what we say, shift the target. We want to move somewhere else. And we felt with, uh, with simulations and, and fluid mechanics and CFD at that time, we, we would get to that point. And we felt we had a, a nice competitive advantage because when it came to spray simulations, we had all the input in the world we needed. We had our own real data. We had our own characteristics data that would make simulations more effective and more robust. This is life for us. This is a pipe. The pipe is here. It's got salt. It corrodes. It corrodes. It shuts down a refinery. How do you put water wash nozzles in there that will maintain that pipe's health and keep the refinery going? A, a, a refinery that shuts down for a day is 
you know, 10, 15 million dollars of losses. So th th this is real, and we cannot do this in the lab. So that's what we, we run into what we call our, our laboratory limitations. So this is actually what set the stage to uh, looking at uh, simulations. Now, keep in mind, we manufacture a, a complicated product, and there is an advantage also from using simulations to design the product. I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end, because that is fairly proprietary. What I'll talk about at the beginning is how we use simulations to really leverage and develop applications better, help customers with, with developing their systems faster, and of course, generating a revenue stream in the process. Gas quench, gas cool is extremely important. Uh, let, me lay, let me lay the basic premise here. You burn fossil fuels, you generate pollutants. The pollutants ex uh, will exit a burner with, with some fly ash and contaminants in them, and then they have to be exhausted to the atmosphere. You cannot simply do that without treating that gas and removing the pollutants. So spray nozzles are used to do two things. They're used to uh, uh, quench the, uh, the, the, uh, the gas, reduce its temperature, and I'll, I'll, I'll say that in a minute, why. And the second thing they're used for is to impart a certain humidity level to the gas. Now, these two things are needed so, A, the gas is not too hot and can be filtered out with a bag house or an electrostatic precipitator, and two, to impart just enough humidity to allow these dust particles to adhere to the filter or scrubbing mechanism, and then after that, the gas can exit the atmosphere without any pollutants. So today, you couldn't obviously run any industrial process without some kind of a pollution control equipment at the end. Gas quench and gas cool is a very important part of the pollution control equipment. For a long time, most of our work was done in this area. A particular customer would be interested in injecting where, where the spray is going to go. Is it going to evaporate? Is it going to reduce the temperature? The most important thing we want to do is reduce the temperature and impart the humidity. So we look at temperature reduction and concentration of spray and, and moisture content. But the other thing is this. If the droplets impinge on the wall and don't evaporate, they will cause damage to the, to the, to the structure itself. So we look at droplet trajectory and evaporation rates as part of that. This particular case, we use DPM with evaporation. A lot of our business for a long time was focused around that. SNCR, SCR, selective calorie reduction and selective non calorie reduction for NOx. This is a big, big deal. Uh, diesel burning uh, power plants or power units, be it on-road trucks, even our cars that we're buying with diesel today have a way to remove NOx out of the stream. And what we do in this case, we, we uh, provide spray nozzles that will spray urea to scrub and neutralize the NOx. In this particular case, we're looking at combustion, and we're looking at chemical reaction as well. And we've done quite a bit of work in that area, primarily for marine-based power units and sometimes even land-based power units, power generation units, and so on. This has became a very important area for us. And keep in mind, we, when we talk about what's going on with the environment and, and, and you know, climate change and all that, these particular polluting processes are things we need to look at. So the need for that and the, 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 the value for a customer is very, very high. And of course, you can't get a license to operate without these things. Condensation. This is actually a way also to neutralize and condition the gas using condensation. This is a particularly interesting problem because we had to deal with cooling and quenching and also condensation, which is by, by means of condensation, which is a slightly slower process. So here we're doing a condensation along with evaporation. This was something new. This was something we only got our hands around about a year ago. This is extremely interesting, and this came about, actually, I need to, I need to thank ANSYS for giving me this idea. I had, I had no, you know, we're always looking for ways to add value and increase revenue stream, and then when the toolbox came out, we started to look at maybe, well, what happens if you have, you know, there's this tool that looks at vibration and structural strengths and so on, and we said, well, now what we want to do is we want to tell our customers, if you're going to put this injector in this very violent environment, 
how do you know it's not going to fall apart? How do you know it's not going to also affect this, the flow of the gas inside the, 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 the reactor itself? So we started looking at the effect of injector placement on the gas stream itself and the effect of loading via temperature or vibration or an environment on the in injector itself. And we started doing some of this work with, uh, with the, the FSI and with the uh, solid modeler. Uh, we got to the point where one of our big customers started to mandate that in the RFQ, and we really like that because that locked out many of our competitors out of, out of the ability to work in this area. Here we're seeing a particular nozzle, and we're looking at this, the bends and stresses as it's in an environment, and then we did transient flow simulations with stress analysis. This is a big, becoming a very, very growing area for us, and we're very happy to be able to leverage the software even further. Um, I uh, do a lot of work with the phosphate industry and with uh, burn, uh, sulfur, dye, uh, sulfur burning, and we make special injectors for that. We were able to use simulations to have a customer in, in Morocco agree with us to optimize our injectors and increase the size and the throughput and the replacement cycle of our injector burners by looking at placement and optimization of these injectors inside the burner and, and overall improving the throughput and the, the higher rate production of sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid is the most used chemical in the world. It is a big, big deal. If you're in that business, you, you get a lot of information how the, where there's increase in capacity and demand, and we have a very, very good high-value proposition in that area. Here we're using DPM model with combustion chemistry. We've published several papers on this topic, and this was an area that was unexplored. Uh, keep in mind that the beauty of trial and error is great when it works. And there are a lot of systems in, in the world that were put into a trial, and, and they've worked very long time. And now when you go and try to optimize them, there's always this aha moment. Why didn't we do this 20 years ago? And look what we have done just by tweaking a few things. And I think that's, that's where the beauty of this project was and the, the return on investment for us. Gas scrubbing. Um, who remembers the famous uh, early, late 80s, early 90s acid rain? Anybody remember that? I'll, you know, very simple. You're burning coal, you're creating SO2. The SO2 goes out to the environment, mixes with moisture. You create a mild form of acid, and that used to fall on our cars and be very irritating and, of course, very, very unhealthy. So the Clean Air Act law mandated that all coal power, burning power plants need to have scrubbers. And in the early 90s, we sold a lot of nozzles for scrubbers. So what happens is you take this gas, you put it into a big, big building next to the power plant, and you give this gas a nice big shower with 2,000 of our best nozzles. Uh, so what we do there is we, uh, we scrub the gas we, with, a, with a calcium slurry. We neutralize the gas, and then we, we collect the, the calcium slurry and the SO2 in a, in a pile and remove it. Obviously, we don't do that, but they do it, and they, they, uh, they end up with clean gas leaving the atmosphere. In this particular case, if you're ever driving by a power plant, you can't miss it. You'll have two big stacks or three, and next to them there'll be this beautiful nondescript block building, and that's just a huge shower. So in this particular case, you can see where the nozzles are. In this case, we're actually looking at DPM model with chemistry. We're looking at two things. We're looking at the ability of the nozzle to generate this right droplet size that will carry the catalyst for the reaction, and we're looking at the effectiveness of the reaction. This afternoon, one of my colleagues, Fong Li, will talk about uh, this, this application in great detail. This is one of the things we, that we talked about in, in, in the first video. We talked about innovating faster and innovating smarter and so on. I work with, with very, very smart people, and, uh, but uh, there's always more things we can learn. And the, I'm, I'm always happy when they come to me and say, we learn something new. This customized injection is one part of it. Where I mentioned earlier, we add our own uh, data to the, as an input to the model. In some cases, we, we had to do things a little bit differently and use nozzles in a ways they were not intended to be used with complex geometries and things like that. And we had to do custom injections for these types of work. 
and with collecting a lot of the data in the lab and understanding how this works, we were able to go in there and create these custom injections to make the simulations much, much more effective. I cannot talk about this a lot because it's very proprietary, but if you heard of liquid gas, liquid, liquid gas, that's a big deal, and we've done a lot of work to try and liquefy the gas and then be able to assist in moving it and so on using these types of nozzles. <clears throat> this is where some of the work we're doing to develop our own product. The ability to develop product faster, the ability to cut down on the number of uh, samples we make. Uh, where I work, we actually have a very, very large machine shop with hundreds and hundreds of CNC machines. We also have a model shop, and their job is to make models and prototypes for the engineer's design. It's always a bottleneck there. There's always a delay, and you have competing people that want different things done. The ability to do one or two or three versions of a design first without actually making a prototype is very, very important. Now, you will say, well, you know, it costs money to run the simulations, and you know, how much do you pay a machinist? That is true. That is true. It's not always about the direct cost, but it's also what you're learning. An engineer on his desk or her desk doing these simulations, doing what-if scenarios and tweaking the design a little bit can learn a lot about behavior that would take a lot longer to learn if you are waiting for prototypes and you're going to test the prototypes. And of course, testing something is always, you always run up the limit of your testing equipment and in some cases your imagination in running an experiment. With simulations, you have a lot more freedom to look at things in a, in a different way that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise. So we, we're very excited about this, but this is the confidential stuff, and I can't show you, unfortunately, a lot of examples. And then we also use Ansoft for our electromechanical designs. We have at spraying systems very fast, actu very fast moving actuators that control dosages, sprays, and very high tech applications. Designing these solenoids and so on is very, very important for us. And for about 10, 12 years, we've been using Ansoft or the predecessor of it. And we use here to, de to develop the right coils to control the stroke length and shut off speed of a, of a fast moving actuator. So what I just showed here in, in totality is where we're using simulations. Most of the time we're using them on the process side and about 20% of the time we're using them on developing our own product. We expect that mix and time to change. Today most of our usage for simulations is coming out of our research group as opposed to our R&D or, or design and development group. We expect that to change uh, in the future. So how did we start? In 2004, uh, I had this brilliant idea that after we contracted Fluent at the time to run a simulation for us that we should bring this in-house. I was very much encouraged by what the Fluent salesman told me. He says, Rudy, you can run this on a laptop, one license. Great, that's what I'm going to do. And of course, that was not true. Uh, <laughs> it, it, was, it was true to a point. I mean. I, I can drive a Formula One race car probably extremely badly, but I can, maybe, maybe one time around the track. So uh, we started, we got a little license, and we had two users, and then we started to see the light. Uh, I'll be very honest with you, we had a lot of resistance from the traditionalists in our company, because this was a different way of doing things. But we, ever since that day, we've just grown and grown and grown. We've grown in terms of projects we've done. We've grown in terms of licensing. We've grown in terms of hardware, software development. We've grown in terms of applications. We've grown in terms of outreach, and we want to continue to grow. I don't see some of these products, Mike, you showed today. I'm kind of, I shouldn't say this because some of my engineers are here, and I don't want to encourage them to come to me with, with a lot of purchase requisitions to sign, but I'm very excited about this immersion and visualization and things like that, because I do think that provides a lot of good value for our customers. So today, where we operate on our third generation server, and, and you know, we're expanding, expanding as fast as we can. Keep in mind, Spring Systems is not a very large company. We're not small, but we're not very large. So this, for us, is actually a pretty good investment. We, uh, we didn't have any modeling engineers. Uh, this old, you notice I'm not on this chart because my picture would ruin these people's beautiful faces. 
Uh, but we, we do simulations in North America, we do simulations in Europe, in Asia, in two places, and also on, uh, you know, New Hampshire is, is, uh, is North America as well. So these people, they work together, they collaborate together on doing different types of projects. We still think the center of our CFD knowledge is in North America, but we have a lot of strengths in Europe and other areas, and we're developing some strengths in Asia and other areas as well. We've grown quite a bit. We, we use all these products, the Fluent, ANSYS, uh, ANSYS Fluent Mechanical Design Modeler, and you know we just bought the ENCO Designer Life not very recently and ANSOFT for a while. Many, many workstations. I keep buying workstations. I think my guys have them at home, which is fine. It's, it's really nice that we're able to, to work <laughs> 24 hours around the clock. Uh, the servers have gotten better, our ability to deliver on projects have gotten better, and it has gotten better not because we've increased licenses and hardware and all that. We are working smarter. We are developing better boundaries on simulations. We're developing better what-if scenarios, and we're leveraging that to do things better and faster. And I'm sure in the next year or so, we'll be upgrading our servers again. But uh, that is not as bad as it used to be. Uh, I was told before I joined Spring Systems that Fluent was a $200,000, $300,000 adventure in the mid-80s just to get a computer in your building, get things going. Today, we're, we're nowhere near that, and it's, bec it's become fairly economical, especially as we upgrade hardware and, and add some licenses. We uh, publish a lot. We're in many, many conferences. We do a lot of uh, presentations on uh, application optimization, most of, sometimes do, do spray characterization, sometimes through modeling. We've been at very recently at all these conferences. This is a book that I put last year, and it's a compendium of all the research papers we've published at Spraying Systems since 1990. That's when I joined, or as I like to refer to as the glory years. Uh, we have, uh, from 1990 to 2012, these were the papers that were in there, and I would have to say almost 40% of them are simulations. Keep in mind, we've only started doing simulations since 2004. That's pretty impressive, the amount of work that was done with, with simulations at Spraying Systems. So let me conclude very quickly and tell you how this has helped. Um, we sell complex systems. We want to be able to give the customer a sense of comfort and sense of uh, assurance when they're buying stuff for us that we can predict its performance and we can do that well. Keep in mind that when we did not do that, the customer still wanted that level of assurance and they would hire a third-party consultant to do this work for them. We feel that the best value we can provide to our customers being directly involved with them, we feel third-party consultants muddy the waters a little bit. We felt that our best interests were not being served and, and being able to do this type, we, we cut that cord, we're directly involved with our customers, so we're able to develop applications faster, we're able to give customers what they need, and we're able to interact with them at a very good and close and personal level. This has led to them increasing their purchases from us, reducing their risk, and more importantly, start to specify these tools and the type of bid package they like to see from suppliers. Now, remember, I started the conversation saying I wanted to shift the target. I wanted to create another area where we can be competitive. That has done so. And that, that is very, very important for us. Of course, it saves time. Of course, it, 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 all these things we've talked about, and we've talked about the multi-physics, but the one thing that's missing and for all the young engineers in this, in, this, uh, in this room, is this type of work doesn't replace engineers. It actually makes engineers better. It makes them better. It makes them smarter. It makes them work with more, more, uh, more uh, intuition and, 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 and better, better set of tools. Um, I have uh, a lot of uh, smart people working with me, and I don't tell them that, be but I should. Uh, they, they, they're the ones who make this work. And I, would, I just rolled out the tools in my introduction. He said, I pioneered. Yeah, well, I, I, you know, I attended a couple uh, training sessions, and I paid the bills. But I think the engineers in this room, which I encourage you all to meet later, are the people who make this work. And because of that, we've been very, very successful. I think we will continue to be very successful, and we will keep pushing, keep pushing the, the uh, 
the simulations to the point where we're even benefiting more from it and developing better value for our customers. We have five, six, seven new projects on tab or things we want to do with simulations, and maybe in a couple of years we'll talk about this. So in closing, I want to thank you for inviting me. I enjoyed giving this presentation. I always enjoy talking about the great things we're doing. And I also want to implore you to, as a Formula One Ferrari fan ever since I was this high, please give Red Bull a, a bad code because I'm tired of them winning. Thank you very much. Yeah.